All right, please take your Bibles and turn over to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. As a staff, we kind of talked through uh, who should speak for Father's Day, and we agreed based on my experience and years of knowledge. I was the best choice, so, um, so I'm bringing your Father's Day message this morning. No, certainly as we consider um, fathers, uh, we can't go wrong when we consider our Heavenly Father and studying Him, and that's exactly what we're going to do today in Matthew chapter 7. When I was a child, like most children, uh, I was quite dependent. Uh, obviously, as a baby, uh, I was very dependent for my, on my mom, my dad, for the necessities, the bare necessities of life. Some of you got that. <laughs> Everything involved uh, from food going in to food going out to going places. Even as I got a little bit older as a four-year-old, if I wanted to go to McDonald's and get myself a happy meal, spend some quality time in the ball pit, I had to get a ride from my mom and dad. <laughs> the question of my dependency in some way and shape and form on my parents was never really in doubt, probably until I was 11 or 12. And that was when I really grew up and I became a real man. <laughs> At least that was what I thought in my own eyes. And, you know, the older I got, the more independent I wanted to be. And that's really considered a, a rite of passage, is it not, for any human being. As you grow older, you are to grow more independent of people. Now, our society today may struggle with that with times, I think, but as a whole, and parents, you teach this to your kids. It's the goal of being independent someday. You don't want your son, who's like 45, still living in your basement, right? So dependency is a, a good thing when you're younger, but as we grow and as we teach and as we instruct our kids, we are instructing them so that they will one day be independent of you. And all of that is good and right. But sometimes I wonder, as I think of this in relationship to our relationship with our Heavenly Father. I wonder if what society has taught us in this has been to the detriment of our understanding of our relationship with God. To the point where, yes, we become or independent, so much so that we don't allow, allow anyone to input authority or thoughts into our lives, to instruct us, to guide us. When it comes to the needs of our life, we don't want to depend on anyone. This might be more of a guy thing. But if you're like me, men, we struggle to depend, do we not, on other people. We want to be independent. We want to be able to take care of ourselves. We can all relate to this concept of growing out of dependency. And as we compare it with our Heavenly Father, and we consider the quest of man's independence from life, I think we've lost sight of what it truly means to rest, to trust, to willingly put ourselves at the mercy and good judgment of someone else, that someone else being God himself. The title of the message this morning is Our Finite Desires and His Infinite Goodness. Our Finite Desires and His Infinite Goodness, and that will make much more sense as we continue on in this passage. Would you look down with me as we read in verses 7 through 11? It says this, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye, shall, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh it shall be opened. Or what man is there of you, whom if his son ask bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he give him a serpent? If he then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven Give good, gift, good things to them that ask him. Let's bow in prayer. Heavenly Father, as we study this passage this morning, where we reflect on, on fathers, where, but more importantly, we reflect on you as our Heavenly Father, I pray that our eyes would be opened or to our need for you, our need to depend upon you for the things of life. Lord, I pray that you would guide my words, guide my thoughts, that we make this passage clear and that we'd be willing to change as a result of it. I pray this in your name. Amen. So as we go through this passage here, these few verses, um, 
as I studied through it myself, I, I started just kind of try, trying to make points out of it, like you do with any preparation for a message. And um, I came up with several, all right, thinking through this. And, um, and so what we're going to do is I'm going to walk through this, and we're going to kind of, under the theme beginning off here of the glorious truths of God's gift of prayer, we're going to study what it means and, and for us to fully understand the idea of God's gift to us of prayer, of a relationship, of communion with Him. In the first couple of verses there, verse 7 and 8, it says, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh it shall be opened unto you. All right, so we're in the middle of Christ's what? His Sermon on the Mount, right? And... This verse oftentimes is sometimes given to unbelievers or applied to unbelievers. That's not meant to be the point. The point is that this is for believers, all right? This is the kind of relationship that Christ is talking about for you who profess to be children of God, all right? So he says what? What can we do as children of God? Ask, it shall be given. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and the door shall be opened unto you. The first glorious truth is, of God's gift of prayer is this. God himself has invited us to commune with him in prayer. God himself has invited you and I to commune with him in, in prayer. You know, he, he doesn't just say it once. Did you notice that? Three times in verse 7, and then he repeats himself in verse 8 for a grand total of six times, commanding us to go to him with our needs, to ask, to seek, to knock. The repetition we see here is certainly indicative of the priority Christ is putting on this concept of prayer. It's as if he's saying, I want you to talk to me. And if you didn't get it the first time, I'll say it again. Come to me. Pray. Seek. Knock on my door. I want you as my children to come and to commune, to pray, to ask of me as your heavenly father. As we compare this with other scripture, we see the same theme reoccurring. 1 Thessalonians 5.17 says, pray without ceasing. Philippians 4.6 says, be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your request be made known unto God. 1 Timothy 2.1 says, I exhort therefore that first of all supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. Ephesians 6, 18 through 19 says, Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. Folks, this is not something that's up for debate as a casual thing that we sometimes engage in when we feel like it or when convenient. All of Scripture teaches that we come to God in prayer. That's not something that we maybe do. It's something that we must do as believers. We are commanded by Christ in this passage to do so. You know, this truth, I could stop here if I wanted to and say this truth should and ought to be enough reason. So why? Why do I, why do we so often fail in this command, in this invitation from God himself to pray, to come before him? Perhaps it's that we don't trust he will hear, answer or care about our problems. Or perhaps it's some some false sense of, of, of piety or self-proclaimed humility that we think it unfitting that we come to him with our requests. How often do we sometimes imagine God on his throne and think, wow, of all the things that he has to consider in this world right now, in this universe right now, does he really care? Should I really come before him with this problem? Certainly a thought that I've had more than once. But the truth is nevertheless there. That God, as we see here, and we're going to continue to unpack, has commanded us. He has opened up the invitation for us to come before him and to pray directly to him. It's a glorious truth. Number two, God will take action as a result of our prayers. God will take action as a result of our prayers. I'll be honest, this is a truth I've struggled to realize. Because how many prayers do we lift up to God sometimes over and over and over and over again over a period of months and years and no answer comes? Do you understand that? You know what I'm talking about? Those endless prayers 
that we become exhausted in. God, here I am again for the 10,000th time praying for you to help, praying for you to work. And then we, we, we go with no answer or seemingly no answer. And then we read a passage like this and it says, ask and you'll receive it. Come on. That can't be true. How many times do I ask God and I do not receive? Or seem to not receive? So this is not a truth that perhaps is very easily or readily accepted by many people. Sometimes we have this view of God that if he wants to, he will, but he probably won't. That's not what this verse says. Over again, it keeps saying, ask and receive, knock, the door will be opened unto you. Some of you know all too well how this feels with the attitude that is reminiscent of an Abraham or a Job, a Hannah, a Joseph. You wait years, questioning, wondering, where is God and why is he not answering my prayer? Yet here we read, Ask and it shall be given you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth. And he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh it shall be opened. That sounds wonderful, but I'm not sure I really believe or feel that to be true in my life. It's perhaps what you may think. There was a great Christian that once lived named C.S. Lewis. You might recognize the name. I shared this with our teens one time. But I read in his book, A Grief Observed, which is a fantastic read, by the way, if you ever get a chance, a small book. It was a book that C.S. Lewis wrote after his wife died. And it's his very raw, very real thoughts as he was walking through this trial. And as he was talking about what it was like to try to pray before God, this is what he said. He said this, Meanwhile, where is God? This is one of the most disquieting symptoms. When you are happy, so happy that you have no sense of needing him, so happy that you are tempted to feel his claims upon you as an interruption, if you remember yourself and turn to him with gratitude and praise, you will be, or so it feels, welcomed with open arms. But go to him when, you, when your need is desperate, when all other help is vain, and what do you find? A door slammed in your face and a sound of bolting and double bolting on the inside. After that, silence. You may as well turn away. The longer you wait, the more emphatic the silence will become. There are no lights in the windows. It might be an empty house. Was it ever inhabited? It seems so once, and that seeming was as strong as this. What can this mean? Why is he so present a commander in our time of prosperity and so very absent a help in a time of trouble. The great C.S. Lewis wrote that. If we're honest, we've all been there, right? Where we, we recognize the struggles of our own heart, the pain, the fears that we are going through, and we run as we are told to in a passage such as this to God and say, God, help me. And somehow we just still feel left right where we were at. And as, he, as C.S. Lewis writes, the door is bolted and double bolted and nothing, silence. It's interesting to me, as I read that portion from C.S. Lewis's book, how similar it seemed to tie into this passage. As if he had this in his mind. As if he's thinking, yeah, God, you said your door, if we knocked, it would open, but I go to your door and it is bolted and you're silent. How do we make sense of this? Is that reality? Is God lying here? What do we do with this passage? Later we're going to dig, dig, dig deeper into this seeming contradiction between Christ's words and our experience. And hopefully we'll see the validity of this great truth that God does take action as a result of our prayers. And folks, that is the truth. I've certainly been speaking of discouraging things for a moment there, but God, in his infinite wisdom, in his infinite knowledge, as we're going to see later on, does answer. He does care. He loves you deeply. And when we call upon him, his promise here is that he will answer. 
every time. He will answer. We're going to flesh that out a little bit further in the, the, in the message, so stay tuned. The third glorious truth in God's gift of prayer is this. God is always available to us. God is always available to us. If you notice the words used in verse 7 and 8, and then imagine the ways in which a child requests things of a father in the home, this might make more sense. So dads, you'll readily understand this. The word ask, coming across as the obvious and present dad standing before the child, hearing the request, as if dad just walked into the door and the little child runs up to daddy. Daddy, daddy, daddy. Can we do this? Can we do this? Can I get this? Can we go here? That type of attitude. He's very visible. He's ready. He's right there, obvious, in front. That next word, seek. Perhaps when the child does not know where their father is, and it's perhaps a time of fear or worry. So what does the child do? He seeks out the father. Where's daddy? Those of you uh, kids in here that have been lost before understand this, right? I was a kid that got lost all the time. So I very much understand this. I had a lot of good ideas about things I wanted to do and where I wanted to go when I was, whenever I was out and about. And oftentimes that got me into trouble. And it was all fun until I realized dad was gone. And then from that point, I was in fear. And I was crying out, dad, dad, where are you? It's that kind of attitude. That word knock. I immediately think of my dad and the hours and hours he spent locked in his, his office um, I, I, I had this picture in my mind of my dad when we were in Canada, and uh, we had a partially finished basement, and, um, and he had this, this office that was in the, par- in the portion that was unfinished. So you had to go into the unfinished part, and there was a door on the left that went into his office. And let me tell you, the unfinished part was a scary place. Kids know what I'm talking about, all right? And what made it worse is it had one of the, our house had one of those, like, house system vacuums, you know? that uh, the vacuum, is a big vacuum in the basement, and there's piping through the rest of the house, and you have a hose, you know, you know what I'm talking about? And uh, that thing was terrifying, all right? So as a child, you know, and, and the worst part was you never really knew when mom was going to vacuum. It just all of a sudden just burst on, you know? And it was always at the worst time. And so I had this vision, I remember, of me going downstairs. If I needed my dad for something, uh, I had to walk into that unfinished part of the basement, you know? And then, of course, it seemed every time, as soon as I'm about to knock, you know, the, the vacuum turns on, mom starts it up. And so then at that point, I'm really freaked out, so I'm just knocking, banging, dad, let me in, the vacuum's going to get me, all that type of stuff. You know, looking back at that time, my dad was very busy, doing important things. And as a child... I had zero inhibitions, you know, I just kind of went down there. I had a need, and I had a dad, and I knew that I could go to my dad, and I could knock. No matter how busy he was, he would open that door. Now, sometimes it was I had to wait on something, or sometimes he would actually just give up on what he was doing and go do what what I wanted to do, but he would always answer. You have that picture here, knock. Regardless of where you feel that God is, sometimes God feels so close, so right in front of us that we can just cry out. He's right there. We can talk to him. We can commune with him. We can ask him. Sometimes we're seeking him. We feel like he is lost or we are lost from him. Sometimes we are, as C.S. Lewis describes there, we are on the other side of the door, but his promise is always the same. Regardless of where we might be at, he is there. He will answer. He is our Heavenly Father. He is always available to us. Regardless of our state of need and how how accessible God may or may not seem to us, he He is there for us. We do not serve an absentee Heavenly Father. Amen? He is always there. He's always accessible. Truth number four. God's offer is given to all. God's offer is given to all. In Christ's verse of repetition, in verse 8, he adds the words, what? Everyone. Everyone. Aren't you glad that we do not serve a God who plays favorites? Now, there was always accusations of favorites in my home growing up. They usually were directed at me because I was the only boy in the family. And, you know, I really, to be honest, I don't think I could argue so much with it because my parents had pity on me most of the time. 
And so because of that, I usually got what I wanted, you know, because it was the least they could do because I didn't have any brothers. So my sisters had each other. I was alone. And so the accusation was always that Josh gets whatever he wants. And, um, and I was happy to go along with that because that was, that was the one bright spot of my growing up years when I didn't have a brother was at least I could get what I usually wanted when it came down to decision making time. But aren't you glad that God does not operate that way? He loves us all equally. His desire for you and his heart for you is the same as the person sitting next to you. If you are in the body of Christ, there is no question about it. Your God loves you with an unfailing, infinite love. And this command of prayer, this opportunity of prayer is available to everyone, not just some. Truth number five. The foundation of prayer is a special relationship. The foundation of prayer is a special relationship. This is something that we've been alluding to the entire message, but Christ comes out and talks about this comparison in verses 9 and 10. Slow it down. It says, Or what man is there of you whom if his son ask bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he give him a serpent? Now before we get into the actual example here, we have to recognize what Christ is saying, all right? We have this example, but within the context of the example is what? A father and his children. And again, what's the, what's the whole, the overarching concept here? Is our relationship with God, right? So he's drawing the comparison here that our relationship to him is like that of a father to his child. And that is the foundation of what we have when we come to this topic of prayer. John 1.12 says, But as many as received him, to them, what? Gave he power to become the sons of God. Even to them that, what? Believe on his name. So if you are here in this room, sitting in these pews tonight, or this morning, and you believe on the name of Jesus Christ, then who are you? You are a son and a daughter of him. Those aren't just words. That is actually how God views you. We've been adopted into the family of God. And so from the moment you professed your faith in him, he looked at you because of what Christ did and said, you are now my son, you are now my daughter, and I will treat you as such. No exceptions. That is the foundation of what we are in Christ. Which then kind of ties into our next point here, our next truth when it comes to our understanding of God's gift of prayer. And that is that prayer is our right, not an earned privilege. That might sound weird at first. It might not even sound quite right. But think through it. Prayer is our right, not an earned privilege. You realize that mere servants and peasants seek to earn an audience with the king. But the son or daughter of the king need not earn that standing. It is their natural right. Their privilege from birth to come into the presence of the king, to commune with him, to spend time with him, to fellowship with him. Our ability to pray to God is a right, certainly not one that we have earned, but nevertheless a right that God has graciously given us because of what Christ did on the cross. And at that point, he accepted us into his family. And from that point, we have every right because of Christ to go before him. Never put yourself in this situation where you think, oh, God doesn't have time for me. God has bigger things to worry about than my little problems. No! You're making light of what God said in his word, that you are a son or a daughter of him. And what kind of father would not be there and available and ready for a son or daughter that he loves? That is the picture of what we have with Christ. Because of what Christ did on the cross for you and I, the veil in the temple leading to the innermost holy of holies was rent in two. And what was once a privilege in one moment became a right to everyone who names the name of Christ. That's the kind of access that we have. Don't make light of that. Don't minimize that. That's you. That's me. 
We are his precious, beloved children, and his unfailing love for us runs far deeper than even the love of our earthly fathers. The kind of access that a child has to his father is even more so the case with our Heavenly Father, which is leading into seven, our seventh point here, our seventh truth. His love is greater than the love of an earthly father. Here we see Christ's own words back this up. Look again, look again at 9 through 11. He says, Or what man is there of you whom of his son ask bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he give him a serpent? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good things to them that ask him? So he paints this little picture here, all right? Again, the comparison and analogy of father with child. He says, what kind of father, if a child came up to him and asked for a loaf of bread, would that father give him a stone? What's the child asking for? He's asking for something that he needs to stay alive, food, right? What kind of loving father would not give him the bread that he needs, or in, in even making it worse, give him something like a rock that he obviously does not need and does not fulfill his need? It's absurd. It wouldn't happen with a loving father. He goes on. What father, what loving father would give a child who is asking for a fish, again, sustenance, food, something that he needs, would in turn not just give him, not give it to him, but then give him something that would harm him, like a serpent. It wouldn't happen. It's absurd, and we can understand that. We have a room here that is full of wonderful fathers, and you certainly understand the truth of this. You would not deny the needs of your children. And furthermore, you would not give them something that is going to hurt them. It makes sense, right? So if we believe the comparison that he is making about our adoption into his family as his sons, as his daughters, then how much more does he love us? And how much more will he treat us with goodness? So as it states in verse 11, compared to sinful men, compared to sinful men, how much more then shall your righteous your spotless, your holy Father, which is in heaven, give good things to them that ask him. Certainly a rhetorical question that needs no explanation. But if what we know of God is true, then the last thing we should ever question is his goodness to us in all things. Which is our final point here. Eight. We pray to a good Father. We pray to a good Father. When we pray, we have the unique privilege of coming before the one who knows all, whose power knows no boundaries, whose wisdom is pure and infinite, whose righteousness is beyond reproach, whose love runs far deeper than our own understanding of the concept of love. And as he is a good, good God, he is a good, good Father. James 1.17, parallel passage of this, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from who? The Father of lights, with whom there is no variableness and no shadow of turning. So eight glorious truths about this concept of prayer, the access that we have to our Heavenly Father. And as we close out today, I want to consider a couple points about making sense here of God's gift of prayer. I addressed earlier the many questions that we have when it comes to prayer. The concerns, the discrepancies that we seem to, fi- to feel or to find in our lives when it comes to our asking God and receiving as he says he, 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 that he will give if we do. How do we make sense of these apparent discrepancies of God's goodness? For the hurting soul who very much feels the heartbeat of the words I read earlier from C.S. Lewis on the absence of God in your time of need. How can he be a good father if that is true? Does he not say in verse 7 and 8 that if we ask, he will give? If this is true, then why is he not giving me what I ask for? How do we reconcile these verses of God's love and provision with our apparent needs 
unanswered. I think there's a couple of points that we see here in this passage that I think will help us understand better what this means and what this looks like as we apply it to our lives. And the number, the number one thing that we must understand is this. We must humbly accept our finite nature. We must humbly accept our finite nature. In verses 9 through 11, we see that comparison of our relationship with God and that of a child with his or her father. And the implication that we see from the scenarios in verses 9 and 10, then compared to verse 11, is that like a father, our heavenly father will much more always make decisions for us that are always good. Now, every dad, understanding that, every dad in this room could get testament to, to certainly not just one, but many requests from your child in which the love that you have for your child and the wisdom that God has given you combined together have resulted in your denial of your child's request. Right? No one in here would argue that a good father will give absolutely everything that your child asks for. That would be an unloving and naive father. But you know what's interesting? Dad, you'll understand this. When your child is asking, they're usually quite convinced that what they're asking for is a good thing, aren't they? One step closer to the edge of the cliff, Daddy, so I can get a better view. All they can see is the idea of getting a better view. They don't understand the danger that is right there. As adults, we understand this and readily apply it to our children. But we somehow fail to see the same parallel in our own relationship with our Heavenly Father. Again, alluding back to my illustration at the very beginning about our dependency. We have been taught as we have grown up that dependency is a bad thing. In many ways, yes, that is true. We don't need to be dependent. We don't want to be dependent on other people. But when it comes to our spiritual life, the opposite is true. We must be dependent on the one who is in control of all. And, we, and it's not just a must. It's not something that we, that we have to do. It's something that we can do. And that we can do with a, a heart of joy and thankfulness because of who it is that we are trusting in. You know, the process of sanctification is our life from the moment we are saved until we go to be with the Lord in heaven. And if we are properly growing in our sanctification, then that means that we should be growing not only in our understanding of God. That one's easy, all right? When we think of sanctification, we think growing like God, growing to understand God more. But part of our sanctification is understanding God and then growing in our understanding of ourselves. What does that mean? What does that look like? It basically means that the more that you grow in your sanctification, you will have a greater view of God. God continues to rise in your view. His truths are changing you. Your understanding of him is becoming much greater, and your appreciation of him is also growing with that. But at the same time, you have your understanding of you here. And if you're growing the right direction, that means you're kind of going down with your, your evaluation of you. The greater God becomes in your mind, the lesser or smaller you ought to become. This is hard because we think we know what we need, when we need it, and how we need it, don't we? And there are some people in here right now that have a burden on their heart that they are 100% convinced is the right thing, is the good thing, is the thing most needed and the best thing for their life, and for the life of you, you can't understand why God is denying you and not answering your prayer as you ask and seek and knock. But have you ever stopped to consider that like a child who doesn't fully understand what he needs, when he needs it, or how he needs it, perhaps you as well, within the constructs of what you value in this world, in this life, the society tells you you need, you should have, Perhaps you also struggle with the same thing. We are finite in our understanding, are we not? We can't see the big picture. We can't understand everything that God is doing. And for that reason, we must trust the one that does. 
So number one, we must humbly accept our finite nature to understand this passage. Number two, we must recognize that God's goodness trumps our request. Think about that. God's goodness trumps our request. As I said before, the obvious implications of verses 9 and 10 are that regardless of what a child were to ask for, a good father will always and only give what is good for his child. Even sometimes if it is to the detriment of the immediate joy of the child, right? As I was preparing this, I I, I was reminded of... uh, situation when I was younger. I was pretty young. I guess I was probably seventh or eighth grade. And um, a bunch of my friends uh, were going camping with a guy in our church. And uh, they invited me to go. And I thought this was great. Um, Camping and friends, good time of fellowship and fun. And in my mind, there was nothing, nothing at all that could possibly be wrong with this idea to go camping. And so what I did is I ran up to my dad's office, and I talked to him about it real quick. I, almost like thinking, I know he'll say yes. I'm just, this is a courtesy ask, you know. And um, so I run up there and say, hey, dad, camping, guy's going camping. This guy's in charge of it. He's running it. So we have adult supervision. It's all good. Happening this time, this time of the week, whatever. Nothing else is going on. Uh, can I go? And it's one of those, like, I'm turning because I'm thinking he's going to say yes, and I hear no. I'm like, wait, hold on. What? Say that again? And so... I do the unfortunate thing that most children do when they hear the word no. Why? Why, Dad? And then I go on to explain all the good reasons I should be going. And you know, my dad didn't give me an answer for why. He said no. And it bugged the fire out of me as a little boy. And I doubted the goodness of my dad at that point. I really kind of thought, dad doesn't love me, (laughs) you know, which is foolishness. But I thought for a moment, dad is denying me this good and fun thing, going camping. And, you know, I I, I kind of forgot about that for several years. And I, I want to say it was maybe a year or two ago. I don't know what brought it up. My mom brought it up to me, though. She said, hey, you remember that time that you asked to go camping? And dad said no. And I kind of think for a second, I was like, oh yeah, that's right. I do remember that. And she said, you know, he never told you this. But it came out after, I don't know how long after that trip, that some very inappropriate things ended up happening on that camping trip. And my dad, for whatever reason, had an unsettled feeling in his heart about some going some of the issues that he already knew of, I think, and because of his wisdom, he said no. I never knew. Year, I mean, this is years later. Not that I was boiling in bitterness all those years, but, <laughs> but you know, I thought how true that is when it comes to our relationship with our Heavenly Father. We are so sometimes convinced that what is good is what we see right there in front of us and what we've determined. And we have nailed it all down. We have gone to God and said, God, this is good for this reason, this reason, this reason, this reason, this reason. And then what happens is we get a no or a silence, which is almost as good as a no for the time being, right? Or we get a long wait. Or sometimes we don't even know. And like me, I waited years and didn't know what the deal was with that, but I later found out what was going on. And I'm so, so thankful that my dad denied me those couple days of what I thought were going to be good joy and fun and spared me a lifetime of hurt. The goodness of God trumps our requests. In his book, called a spiritual, or a call to spiritual reformation, D.A. Carson said this. Um, He was discussing in the book what he believed was the greatest problem with the modern church, and he he arrived at the the concept of prayer. But he started with his concept, though, with understanding God, and he said this, when it comes to knowing God, we are a culture of the spiritually stunted. So much of our religion is packaged to address our felt needs, 
And these are almost uniformly anchored in our pursuit of our own happiness and fulfillment. God simply becomes the great being who, potentially at least, meets our needs and fulfills our aspirations. We think rather little of what he is like, what he expects of us, what he seeks in us. We are not captured by his holiness and his love. His thoughts and words capture too little of our imagination, too little little of our discourse, too few of our priorities. Did you catch what he was saying there? Our whole perception of goodness and what we've constructed, our ideas of what that ought to look like in our life, is sometimes so false. And we're so easily convinced of it. That when we go to God, we're praying for something that really is just selfish ambition. And thankfully, we serve a God who in in His infinite wisdom, infinite love, because He is a good Father, denies us sometimes. What we are so sure is what we need. We must have faith in the God that we say we serve. Folks, returning to a dependency upon God requires that we humble ourselves, removing the veil of perceived goodness that our culture and religions and society have constructed around us, and learning to take God at his word. Trusting that he is the good God that he says he is. Yes, when we knock, when we come to him, he will hear us. He does hear you. He will answer. It may not be the answer you want, but you can always be sure it will be the best answer Because he is a good God, and he always has your best interest at heart. Take God at his word, and grow in your understanding of your finite desires, and his infinite goodness. Would you bow your heads?